already espoused myself not to be a lawyer. I am the second person to do uh, to do that, but uh, very different uh, in this perspective because I'm a criminologist, and rarely when I come to these things, apart from one specific group that I'm a member of, are there many other criminologists there. So just quickly, is there anybody in this room that might? declare themselves to be either a criminologist or some of the works in sort of socio-legal studies. Thank you, I'm one of the person, right? Yeah, a couple. Somebody's not sure, okay. Deciding what I'm going to say first, then deciding if he wants to align himself with anything that I've said. Um, the purpose of this talk is not to sort of sell criminology, criminology's role, what criminology can do, but that obviously is an underlying issue uh, of everything that I'm going to say. Um, in terms of criminology, we are becoming more interested in things that criminology has not traditionally been interested in. A lot of that comes in the field that we refer to as green criminology, so things around uh, environmental crime, environmental harm, and harm to non-human animals, not just wildlife. Um, there is a lot that criminology can do, so some of the things I'm going to talk about puts an onus on, on people working in criminology to do more research to find out about these things more. But also, criminology can inform other people working in this field where we've previously not been involved at all. Uh, working with conservationists, working with lawyers, etc, etc. So that's kind of the underlying theme. But what I'm specifically talking about, obviously, today is this sort of issue of wildlife law. And as I said, because we saw that a couple of the, uh, the titles of the presentations were quite similar, I stressed the, uh, the emphasis of can it be fit for purpose. Mine's a bit more of a general consideration about the use of law, the use of criminalisation, and whether that is the best approach for trying to actually do something about harm to wildlife. But interestingly, a lot of what I say very much overlaps with a lot of what Mark said as well. So, uh, what I'm going to cover today are controlling harms against wildlife. So, very briefly, what wildlife, what harms, what, what methods might we use? Does the law need to be improved in order to do this in terms of problems of existing approaches which I will be able to go through very quickly because they've been quite well rehearsed already today? And is criminalisation the answer? So what are the alternatives, what other approaches might we take for reducing harm? But then specifically what are the benefits of retaining criminalisation and how should having criminal law be then used to best reduce harm? Because just having a law, as has already been said, is not the way that you reduce harm. You then have to apply that law and use that law appropriately. And then I'll finish with some ideas about how we might take things forward and hopefully some points that might lead to further discussion. So firstly, we cannot ignore the fact, although everybody pretty much has so far, because it's such a difficult thing to talk about, should wildlife be protected from harm? That is an underlying question of everything that we then go on to do. Now, we're not going to answer that today. I'm sure we will all have various opinions and, and different uh, views on this. But we can't ignore the fact that any legislation that is introduced, particularly where it criminalises behaviour, is going to come from a particular ethos, is going to come from a particular perspective, and that is not going to be agreed upon by everybody. And depending upon what that perspective is, it is going to influence what that law will look like how that law will be applied, and how we will measure whether it has been successful or not. So, for example, if the reason we introduce, introduce wildlife law and wildlife uh, criminalisation for, for harmful acts, if the perspective is from the idea that we want to um, retain biodiversity, we don't want to destroy habitats, we want to protect endangered species, because of the benefit that we as humans, for example, get from them, then obviously the effectiveness of that law will be measured by looking at, once it's been introduced, have a protected species and less species become endangered, have less species gone extinct. If, however, we introduce it from an ethos from a very abolitionist perspective, uh, that we shouldn't, as humans, be interfering in any way with uh, the free movement and natural behaviour of wildlife, then obviously the effectiveness is going to be measured in a much more different way, much more difficult way to, to, to measure that effectiveness. Of course, to say this is clearly, I say maybe beyond the scope of discussion, today it is clearly beyond the scope of discussion. But actually, whatever our answer to that question is, is going to influence everything else that we seek to do, and I think it needs to be recognised. So there's a whole range of competing interests and ideologies, which I think we do see a little bit in criminology, we do see a little bit within criminal law, but probably more contentious than, than many other issues, apart from perhaps some of the most sort of current hot topics, things like assisted suicide and whether that ought to be decriminalised and so forth. So we have to recognise it's extremely important. 
We also have to recognise what wildlife we're deeming worthy of protection. And much of the, uh, the talk today has been prompted, obviously, by uh, the interim report of the Law Commission, which was particularly about wildlife management. So it tends to be around uh, things like disturbing and poaching and those kinds of activities. Um, but obviously, in the sort of wider context of talking about wildlife law, which I think we can still sort of uh, include in today's talk, there's also this debate about which species. So we sort of talked about the fact that some species are protected, others aren't. Not only does this create uh, concerns for people that are taking sort of en en uh, animal rights and species justice approach, why do we favour some species over another, but it also makes it very difficult to enforce because sometimes identifying a very specific species will determine whether the law has been broken or not. Generally speaking, what we tend to find is we take an anthropocentric approach to this kind of legislation, and the wildlife that we deem worthy of protecting is that which is endangered. It seems in some way iconic. Uh, it's a special interest for some other reason, so it may serve a particularly useful purpose uh, for, it's all right to use the students talking during my lecture, so a little bit of rattling and bang is going to put me on. Uh, there's some other special interest or some special purpose that they serve, uh, for example, they're cute, they're attractive, they're not ugly animals, or they're particularly important for biosphere and ecosystem services, for example, bees. So we tend to protect that kind of wildlife, and much of the wildlife uh, gets ignored. So from an environmental justice conception, which is predominantly what our wildlife law tends to now look like, uh, it's those things that serve a purpose to humans, even if it's just the pleasure of seeing them in the wild. And so they bring some sort of pleasure to us. And that obviously, again, can raise a number of difficulties when our opinions about this conflict. For example, badgers and foxes. We're not going to go any further there, but you can see where I'm, where I'm going. Also thinking about other non-human animals as well. Again, very briefly, because obviously what we're interested in today is specifically around wildlife, but obviously when we're thinking about non-human animals of which wildlife, that wildlife label may be attached to some of them, there is also a similar range of debates around other non-human animals, for example, welfare legislation, so companion animals, farmed animals, laboratory animals, for example. So again, all of this is still open to debate as well. Who, which species should we protect? what behaviours should be included in our control methods, what welfare standards should be applied, which even again itself is contentious because obviously you've got abolitionists versus welfareists versus people who just want to make some money. So again, we've got this problem of consensus, to say, not specifically uh, directly related to uh, today's main focus, but again, if we're talking about wildlife, we need to think about some of these uh, conceptions and where we're coming from. So this brings us to that issue of harm. What harm should be prevented, minimised or otherwise controlled? Fundamentally, we've already seen and asked the question, why do we want wildlife law? What is wildlife law trying to achieve? And from a criminologist's perspective, normally when we make something illegal and we criminalise it, it's because we've recognised there is some harm and that harm is significant enough that it needs to be controlled. So we've got uh, competing rights or competing interests uh, and some harm is caused and that behaviour therefore needs to be controlled to try and prevent that and criminalisation is perhaps seen as the best way to go about doing it. But of course this then raises questions about what we mean by harm. Should the harm even be controlled at all? Uh, what level of harm has to occur before we actually want to intervene? Um, and why is some harm acceptable and other harm not? So again, generally we take an anthropocentric approach to this. Certain purposes, harm is deemed to be perfectly acceptable compared to others. The harm that may be caused from, in some of this wildlife legislation, taking one egg for example, that's taking uh, the life of one, one animal or the potential life of one animal, or that could be having a massive effect uh, because it's a significantly endangered species, but compare that also to the billions of animals that are slaughtered for food every year, for example. So how do we construct these conceptions of harm and decide what we're going to uh, get involved in? And again, we're unlikely to get a consensus. I had to say that, but that aside, we also have to move on to the next issue as well. I do think, however, it is extremely important and it is obviously going to, to, to taint everything that is done from that point forward because all these different interest groups coming together with, with different ideologies. So in terms of, we've identified we've got some harm, we might reach some consensus, or we recognise that somebody's going to make that decision for us, and there is some harm that we want to try and control the behaviour of. That's what the rest of the, uh, the talk's going to be about. 
So what are the different ways that we might try and control that harmful behaviour? We might do nothing. We might say actually the best thing to do is not control it at all. We know for example from criminology that actually intervening uh, in people engaging upon a criminal career at the beginning of that criminal career is probably more likely to make them continue committing crime than if we did nothing at all. Uh, so there's not actually really any reason to have any criminologists or any law because the best thing to do is let people do what they want and they'll soon grow out of it. That's a little bit flippant, but we, that's one of the things that, that we recognise in criminology. So we might actually decide the best thing to do is nothing. And these behaviours will actually start to regulate themselves. We may go down the education and awareness raising route. So let's just kind of actually educate people as to the harms and the detriments that their behaviours cause. And that in itself might be enough to actually reduce harm to prevent that behaviour from taking place. We may want to try and do things that increase what we refer to as informal social control. So those kinds of uh, mechanisms that might increase the extent to which the community or the general public actually sense your behaviour itself. Because again, we know from criminology that actually informal social control by those people around you has a much greater effect on the behaviour that you then carry out than does state formal control. So you're more interested in what people near to you think about you and whether they censor your behaviour than what the state and a removed government try to do uh, to try and stop you from behaving in a certain way. Then of course we get into the more formalised approaches, regulation, so this, and this isn't in any way meant to be exhaustive, but some ideas of uh, kind of getting, I suppose, gradually uh, harsher. Generally around licensing, which is a system obviously that's used predominantly uh, within this approach, particularly around things like hunting. Uh, restrictions, limits and quotas that can be applied. Certain prescribed methods, you can do this behaviour but you can't do it in this way. Uh, and then, of course, all of the sanctions of breach, which can include soft compliance, so providing support to people, you know, why are you doing it in this way? We can actually show you a better way to do it that's less harmful, and by the way, it'll save you money, do your reputation better, whatever it might be. Discussion, training, arbitration, and so forth. The hard compliance that remains uh, non-criminal, so obviously things like fines, suspensions of practice and license revocations. And then possibly criminal proceedings, but for the breach of the regulations rather than the behaviour itself. Then you've got prohibition with some kind of civil sanction, and obviously finally you've got criminalisation. I'm not going to tell you which one of those I think is, is right. We don't know which one of those is right. I'm going to raise them again, and hopefully that might be again something else that sort of comes up for discussion. Um, and I'll talk about that again later. But as you'll see, I generally favour criminalisation for certain behaviour. So our first problem, when we're asking, can criminal law be fit for purpose, our first problem is this idea of agreement. Are we going to agree on what that criminal law should be doing? Um, probably the answer is no, but that doesn't mean we just all throw our hands up and go home. We have to kind of work around the fact that we can't probably actually agree on that. So all of these competing perspectives, you've got eco-justice or species justice perspectives, which tend to try to be less anthropocentric and not try and control harm just because of how it benefits humans, but because of how that harm impacts upon the wider environment and the animals, whether they be recognised as having rights or otherwise. You've got abolitionists who don't think we should cause any harm at all. Welfareists who recognise the need to cause some harm but ensure that animal welfare is protected in those cases. And then of course we're always going to have disagreement between people's individual interests and pursuits and economic interests of corporations. So we're always going to have that, that problem to try and surmount. Putting aside this huge issue around consensus regarding what species and what harms, what about this issue of utilising criminal legislation, which is basically what we're, we're talking about trying to still do today. So it's already been recognised that the ex existing methods that we have that rely on criminal law face a whole host of problems, which are again summarised there and then we've seen them rehearsed previously. The laws that currently exist are very diverse, they may not be up to date, they may not have been introduced to do what they were supposed to, they can be quite confusing, complex, difficult to apply, the available sentences that are attached to that legislation, etc, etc. The breadth of issues that are covered, um, I know Angus has, has talked about this as well in a lot of the things that he's written, wildlife crime is not one thing. It is such a range of behaviours, as I'm sure you will all recognise, it is such a range of diverse behaviours that to talk about a wildlife criminal or say there is one way to tackle wildlife crime 
or all wildlife crime should be, should be approached in the same way or is motivated by the same reasons, it clearly would be absurd. It is such a range of behaviours. You've got a, a single individual case of somebody perhaps bringing home an item from on holiday abroad that, that doesn't realise that they might be contravening uh, Coatees regulations, for example. Or you might have organised crime groups that are smuggling endangered species into the country alongside arms and drugs and using funding for terrorism. You've got somebody who poaches one individual item, you've got somebody who is a regular raptor persecutor, who is a collector, for example. There are such a range of different behaviours, different motivations, different people, there is not going to be one answer. There may well be one, two, three pieces of legislation that can criminalise that range of behaviours, but how you then use that legislation to tackle your different offenders will need to be different depending upon what it is they're doing that crime for and what type of crime it is. It's also been recognised as a lack of knowledge throughout the criminal justice system uh, in terms of, of expertise and specialist knowledge, uh, not only in terms of the best way to, to sort of stop this and to enforce it, also in terms of interpreting the legislation uh, and, and therefore being able to find whether somebody's guilty or not, and in terms of investigating um, whether an offence has been committed or not. Even as I said previously, such things as trying to identify a particular species as to whether it should be protected. And my two major concerns here are in relation to the effectiveness of controlling behaviour through criminalisation and the problems with relying on enforcement again, which have been raised by speakers previously. So in terms of the effectiveness of criminal law, if we assume that the aim is to reduce or prevent prescribed behaviour, which we have to assume it is because otherwise what's the point in having it, the purpose of law is not to prosecute people for the sake of it, the purpose of law is to stop that behaviour from happening, that's why we want it. So we're trying to reduce or prevent this harm, this behaviour. Then for it to be effective, I would argue it needs to achieve one or more of the following things. It either needs to moralise the populace and denounce certain behaviour, and that can be a legitimate purpose in its own right. That can be enough on its own. Uh, Recognising something as a crime can help moralise the community and, and make them understand the severity of that behaviour. You're therefore more likely to get more informal control, you're more likely to get higher reporting rates because people recognise it as a serious harm. If we just say something's regulatory and we just fine people a little bit for it and we don't criminalise it, it in some ways could be seen amongst the public to be little that offence and make it seem less serious. And or criminal law needs to act as a general deterrent. So a lot of what's been talked about today and uh, I will, I will go out there and say I, I blame the lawyers for this specifically, um, is that the purpose of law is to deter people from committing crime. Now, as a criminologist, I will, not in all cases, but I will tell you, deterrence doesn't work. So if that's your aim, then it's pointless. You may as well not have that law. Because if you think that actually what you're going to do by having that law is make most people who commit wildlife crime decide they're not going to do it, then criminology will tell you that you're wrong basically. And that's one of the things I think chronology can bring is expertise in these areas. Now it's possible that people that commit wildlife crime are very different to anybody else and might react completely differently uh, to criminal legislation, but I think it's highly unlikely. I'll say a little bit more about why that is in a moment. And of course the final thing that the law might be trying to achieve is to reduce the likelihood of any future criminal actions of the individuals who've committed the offence. So B is about us all deciding we're not going to offend because we're scared of getting caught and what will happen to us. C is all about those people who've done something and get caught, we then do something with them as a result of criminalising them that should stop them from committing further offences. And generally speaking that's either through incapacitating them in some way, uh, deterring them as individuals from ever doing it again, rehabilitating them or using some kind of restorative intervention with them. And of course the sentencing that follows is usually dependent upon whatever our political ideology is at that time. So, in terms of moralisation, evidentially I would argue that actually this is probably the most defensible purpose for criminal law. It can also be considered necessary to achieve all of the other aims as well. So if we want to try and deter, and we want to try and punish people and do something with them so they don't offend again, then actually having a moralised pop, uh, population is going to help underpin all of those things and support that. As I said previously, we know that people tend to be more likely to deter, they'll control their own behaviour, when there's some sort of sense here from what Braithwaite refers to as a personally relevant collective. Somebody or some group that matters to you. Their opinion of you will have a much greater effect than the opinion of the state. 
So demonstrating society's abhorrence of these kinds of acts through criminalisation is actually very important. And I would even go so far as to say that if that's the only purpose it serves, I actually think that still justifies predominantly criminalisation of wildlife offences. Perhaps there might be exceptions to that, but predominantly I would argue that would be sufficient. That's my little time ago, not to say I've done over time. I shall go uh, as quickly as I can. In terms of deterrence, I think I've already pulled this to pieces, but just to, to explain why that's the case. Criminology, again, and research in this area will tell you that for deterrence to be successful, you have to achieve three particular elements. They has to be severe enough, it has to be swift enough, and there has to be certainty of punishment. We already have argued that the penalties aren't severe enough. Yes, we can do something about that. Yes, it appears there are moves to actually tackle that to an extent. Whether those penalties will be severe enough is questionable, but, but we might be able to do something about that. Whether it happens or not, uh, we will have to wait and see. Punishment has to be swift. It has to come quickly after the offence, so that the psychological link is made in the offender's mind between what they've done and the punishment they've received. We know that the criminal justice system is generally a very slow beast, and that's even more so the case for low-level offending. That said, it's actually probably the, the lesser importance of, of the three. This is sort of standard in terms of crime. We're, we're used to sort of seeing that. The most important feature for successful deterrence is certainty of punishment. So you know you're going to get caught, or you expect you're going to get caught, and you will know what the sentence is going to be once you get caught. So there has to be certainty in respect to both of those things. That said, however, it's also the least achievable. So the thing that is the most important is the thing that we are least likely to be able to actually do. We've got an extremely high dark figure of wildlife crime, and with the best will in the world, no matter how much we improve enforcement and reporting and recording, that dark figure is going to remain extremely high. We have very high dark figures for, for more traditional crimes as well, uh, those things that are never reported to the police or recorded by them, particularly things like domestic violence and sexual offences. And those are crimes that have victims. And as we've seen, legally, wildlife crime doesn't have a victim because an animal can't be a victim in law. So who's going to bring that case on the animal's behalf? In fact, actually, most of these offences will occur without anybody even knowing that it's happened. So that dark figure is always going to remain high. When you've got a dark figure, that means you've got very, very low attrition, which means very, very few people are ever going to get tried for these offences. So you can give them the highest sentence that you like, and you can put them in the papers as much as you want, but it's such a tiny proportion that all it takes is one offender to know somebody else who's got away with it that can negate all of that publicity. So we're not going to be able to achieve this kind of certainty. And of course the other important thing about criminal law is achieving reduction. Now I've already considered the fact that it's unlikely to achieve reduction through deterrent effect, but there might be other ways that criminal law could achieve some kind of reduction. So there are alternative reductive sentences that could be used However, these also remain problematic. Very few people are identified, prosecuted and convicted, so no matter what we do, we're going to get a tiny proportion of our offenders. When people are convicted, there's a tendency to punish through fines. Fines are rarely reductive unless the fine is so high that it completely incapacitates that person's ability uh, to, to carry on those acts any further. So, if you find somebody, you're not rehabilitating them, you're not engaging in, in any kind of restorative practice, and it's rarely incapacitated. The effects of incapacitated sentencing when we do it are generally limited. There's not really any evidence that if you lock people up and do nothing with them while they're locked up and let them out, that they'll stop that behaviour. It just means that you get a bit of a respite while they're in prison. And there's no evidence or precedent really for using anything more innovative, for example, rehabilitative or restorative uh, type responses in this field. However, I don't think that precludes such an approach, and I think that's something that should be discussed more. How might we use principles of restorative justice, for example, in this kind of arena as a form uh, of response? There's also a whole host of problems in relying on enforcement as the way to then actually do something with this law. So, as again, as Angus has also said, and as I said in a couple of things that, that I've written, you can have the best law in the world, but if you can't enforce it, it's not going to have any effect whatsoever. So, wildlife crime tends to be marginalised, not amongst those of us who are interested in it, but amongst everybody else. Uh, so, attitudinally and financially, not enough resources, not enough staff, not enough systems. For example, things like intelligence collection and carrying out analysis, which is what we do with our other crimes uh, that we take seriously, but not something that, that we do to the same extent with wildlife crime. And uh, having access to technology, 
which isn't just technology in terms of things like CCTV cameras or DNA testing, but also technology that can be used to help underpin prevention. For example, doing things like crime mapping to find out where your wildlife crime hotspots might be to know where to put your resources. As I said, it's underreported, so we probably don't know about most of it. How can you enforce something if you don't know it's going on? It's extremely difficult to obtain the necessary evidence to bring criminal prosecutions. Perhaps that is something that can be helped uh, in terms of how we draft legislation, but there's a lot of other issues in relation to that as well. And where you ask people to enforce, who are also working in regulatory systems, advisory systems, or other kind of uh, relationships where people are expected to normally work together, it can have real problems in terms of those relationships. So this is again something that needs to be thought about in terms of two-tier systems. If you have a system that uses soft and hard compliance and criminalisation, it can be very difficult in terms of the relationship between those agencies and those organisations. And then all of the issues related to prosecution and sentencing, which if you want to read more about what I said about that, the reference there. So, is criminalisation the answer? Look again at those options for formal control. I'm not going to talk about them anymore now, but look again at them. Perhaps that's something that's worth discussing. Is criminalisation the way to go? The benefits of retaining criminalisation to start to draw this to a close The censure, denunciation and moralising effects of criminal law are arguably the, the strongest way to get the message out of the unacceptability of these kinds of acts and omissions. And for that reason, I would argue that we should go down the criminalisation route for the majority of behaviours. We could also consider attaching to that, though, to make it more effective, the use of alternative sentencing options. Because deterrence is unlikely to work, we should be discussing ways to sentence that includes rehabilitation, compensation and restoration. And for me, perhaps the two key practical benefits of having criminalisation are that it underpins prevention activity. And I think we should be talking a lot less about deterrence and enforcement and what legislation should look like, and a lot more about how you prevent this behaviour in the first place using the best means possible. It also further mandates those people that have got the most experience in preventing, investigating and enforcing against deviant behaviour. Something is criminalised, it means it falls on the auspices of people who are a bit more experienced in dealing with this. Now, in terms of that expertise, which I'll talk about at the moment, ideally, we want that much more within the criminal justice system. And I know, again, that's something that, that, that Angus has called for. This should be mainstream as part of criminal justice, not seen as an add-on that's dealt with very differently to all other forms of crime. That said, we would also recognise there's clear expertise in this area from NGOs as well, and you wouldn't want to exclude NGO groups from this. For me, however, mainly because as a criminologist, this is my field, this is my area uh, of expertise, the key aim is to prevent harm in the first place. So taking a primary or secondary prevention approach has got to be better than following a dubious tertiary one. Tertiary is where we do something with people once we've caught them to try and stop them offending. Primary and secondary are when we try and do something before, before the acts have occurred. Doesn't require behaviour to be criminalised in order to do prevention, but it helps underpin situational crime prevention approaches. If you want to know more about that, that's something I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so working on the decision-making processes of people who are rational offenders, not necessarily they sit down and they do a sort of big economic analysis of whether they should carry out the crime or not, but if you are presented with an opportunity to commit a crime, you think you're going to get some rewards, you think you're going to get away with it, you can neutralise that behaviour and make excuses about whether it's really criminal or not, there's a much greater chance that you'll take that opportunity. So if you can do things in situational crime prevention, which we put under the headings of increase the risk, uh, increase the effort, reduce the rewards, remove the excuses and reduce the provocations, then you'll remove the opportunity to commit crime, or reduce it at least, and therefore you will get less crime. So, so from a criminological perspective, another thing that we can bring is expertise in, in prevention. Arguably, having criminalisation encourages people to engage more with preventative interventions because the people who are most expert at doing this kind of prevention work in relation to crime are the police. When the police were formed, their main purpose was to prevent crime. That's, that's been their remit for, for many years. And it also encourages prevention experts to be involved. So even if it remains marginalised, if it's criminalised, it means that it at least in part falls under the purview of the police or others who have enforcement experience, such as the RSPCA. And if we advocate prevention, then that police expertise in this field is invaluable. In terms of our more traditional approaches to crime, we are now experts in doing things like problem-oriented policing, POP, 
So we don't just throw our resources everywhere and hope we catch them on. We don't just wait until someone rings up and says, I've been burgled, and then do something about it. We look at where our crimes are taking place, when they're taking place, how they seem to be occurring, we map them, we determine the best places to put our resources, we do very sort of problem-focused uh, interventions, more proactive methods of policing. The national intelligence model as well being applied to this, and doing uh, crime analysis. Crime analysis has, has been sort of embedded in policing since around about 97, 98, uh, certainly since the introduction of the national intelligence model. Doing more of this kind of stuff that, that, that ENSYS used to do, and its, it's uh, um, successors now do, but doing more analysis on the ground level to intervene with these types of crime is going to help us determine where to do our prevention and the best way to prevent these kinds of behaviours. Also, these have got experience in terms of partnership working, and I'm aware that we do have the Partnership Against Wildlife Crime, and that should be seen as the kind of gold standard for intervention in terms of getting agencies to work together, but that, those agencies have to include local authorities, policing, and obviously other interested groups who are expert in the area. As I said, this idea is situational crime prevention. It's something that, that the police particularly are very familiar with in terms of methods and approaches and analysing your data to actually tell you what you need to do to do prevention. So to take things forward, the consensus on harms uh, of what to include is always going to be problematic. Alternatives to criminalisation should be considered if they are, can be shown to be more effective at reducing harm. I think it would be arguable to show that's the case, but if they could be shown, then obviously our main aim should be to reduce harm, so we do whatever we need to do to reduce harm. But there's also very good reasons for using criminal law. However, it will require better legislation, and that's what the rest of the talks have predominantly been about. Alternative aims of sentencing to be explored and incorporated. More resources, easy for me to say, I'm just a criminologist who sits in the university and don't have to fund that, but more resources, uh, or better used resources as well, putting resources in the right place, doing the right things with them, not necessarily throwing money at things like prosecutions, for example, but putting your resources into prevention and into research so you know exactly what your problems are and an emphasis on moralising and denunciation, and importantly, prevention over prosecution. Thank you very much. So, I'm just talking very fast. I think you've had the whole second gear there. Um, we can take, since coffee has arrived, um, you clearly heard that happening, um, if we can take a couple of questions and then I'll go for a General, then, then we'll have the copyright. Uh, I was just going to say, there is actually one instance that I know of, there could be more, I mean, I, I, and only hazily, of restorative justice. Um, it was, if I remember rightly, it was concerning a roof, a roof had to be re-roofed, and there were, I think, sparrows' nests which were destroyed in the process, and um, the prosecution, and the, I don't know whether it was roofers or builders or the people who had perpetrated the incident and um, I think also the employers um, were sort of called in and they were asked, they, it was explained to them that they, what they'd done and, and, and the, uh, um, the penalty was to put up some new um, sparrows terraces and um, make sure essentially that they didn't um, do it in future. It seemed to me, if that works, and um, that is a very good sort of penalty, if employed in the right sort of situation. Yeah, and I, I know there are, I don't know specific examples, but I know that restorative justice is something that is being explored, and there are international examples of using it within, obviously, the environmental sort of enforcement regimes and in terms of, of wildlife. And obviously for restorative justice you've got two elements. You've got the sort of restorative justice element which is about actually getting the parties together, getting the offender to see the harm that they've caused, getting them to make an apology and then to do something to put that harm right and then be really accepted into society which generally works better for preventing future offending. But also at the same time, which is particularly important for us, it's about restoring things back as much as we can prior to what it was, uh, prior to the harm being caused. And obviously that must be the better way of doing it than just getting some money that just goes in some coffers somewhere and doesn't actually achieve anything. I'm going to go Keith, then Erica, then Coffee. <laughs> I think this is one where 
If this is one you can bring up in the panel discussion, if you want to finish. I might highlight it now, just because okay. I think the picture. I wonder whether... Um, okay, so the regulatory model for the United Kingdom is criminal law and has been for um, forever. So the reason that we call it wildlife crime isn't because it's wildlife crime, it's just that it's wildlife regulation, which is wildlife crime. If we started again with a regulatory model, why would we criminalise it? At one level, and I slightly disagree with this, but people say that criminalisation is, is a marker, so it makes this is the worst thing, so therefore we have, we have criminalised it. I don't necessarily agree that that's always work. But what criminalisation absolutely does is ascribe the regulator. It is the police. Um, there are exceptions to this. The EA is both prosecuting a fire and investigation of authority and the civil sanctions of authority. But in wildlife crime, crime the, the choice of criminalisation is by the regulator. Is that the best way of thinking, thinking, thinking about this world? When what we're really talking about is the regulation of human, of the collection of human, be, um, human behaviour. So a better way of thinking about it might be to think about information flows or to think about who is the most likely person to be able to regulate a particular type of harm or behaviour. And that is more likely when in a world where licensing has been accepted to be the regulator, Natural England, not the police. But whilst the police might be the appropriate regulator for this purpose in the middle of a wood or uh, midnight, where there's, um, it might not be in relation to a, a person exceeding their wind farm license or something, something like that. So I, I kind of wanted to open up the criminalise, you know, the criminalisation nature of itself. You made me think about it essentially, and whether we really need to depart from the idea of thinking about this this always sort of wildlife crime, so some form of bit of path dependency that we've got locked into. As I said, I think Angus might now film. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to my slightly ranty response. Which I'm sure Keith has tried to provoke. I think there are real dangers to having two-tier approaches to behaviour that looks like it's very similar. So that certain organisations, and that's normally going to therefore be businesses and corporations, um, who probably have got the most means to avoid causing these harms, and perhaps have individuals, get what is seen as a softer response than individuals. That said, in terms of the criminalisation issue, again, I think the problem that you're falling foul to there is thinking that wildlife crime is one thing, and of course it isn't. And although we don't know this because the research hasn't been carried out, and I know Angus has looked at this a little bit, there's another concept within criminology that refers to self-selection, this idea that people who do big bad things also do little bad things. And actually, one of the best ways to catch your most serious criminals is to catch them for their very minor things. And the first time the research was carried out, it was looking at people that parked illegally in disabled parking bays. And there was a much higher proportion of, of cars in the research uh, that were owned by people who had uh, warrants for their immediate arrest than in the general population. So people who are doing serious things are also going to uh, infringe more minor regulations. There's been research carried out on that in relation to disabled parking bays, uh, people who are issued with uh, tra road traffic producers, people visiting uh, a young offenders institute as visitors, uh, and people given other forms of fixed penalty traffic notice. It is highly likely that if the research was carried out on wildlife offences, you would again see an overlap in these populations. So you know, criminals do not specialise. Criminals commit lots of different types of crime, and some of that will also be uh, wildlife offences. So actually, you're looking at the same people and then they're trying to be regulated by lots of different bodies. Actually, I think having one body that deals with these people that might be criminals actually is more effective. You seem to be assuming that it, it's victimless, whereas if you're get, getting rid of criminal, um, when you think of what people do to badgers and birds and so on, it, it, surely it's acquired by, in terms of welfare, it's acquired by. I wasn't making that assumption actually, but I was wondering whether we do occasionally make an assumption that we apply criminalisation as a standard across what is actually a piece of regulated human activity. And consequently, the converse of me potentially falling into my split regulator across a single thing is to say that it could also just be criminalised. And I disagree if what one focuses on is the prevention of the harm rather than the labelling of it as criminal. 
although I do take your point about moralization of the law being a, a feature of criminal law. So it's about getting the results, which I, and I'm not, and the statistics don't like, bear up the, the um, that wildlife crime is solved by it being wildlife crime. We may come back to that. Um, Erica, you have a question? Uh, yes, I mean, I think your presentation was excellent, actually. And uh, it seemed like what you were getting at was a little bit what the mayor of Bogota, Mokus, demonstrated in his, in his city when he made sure that, I mean, the problem that, he, that there was so much crime there was that the moral, the cultural, and the legal didn't correspond to each other. So there was just a uh, disparity between these norms, essentially. And he made sure that they converged and used, for example, these informal uh, social controls. He used citizens to patrol streets and be traffic wardens, and that increased compliance and everything. It was a real overhaul. And I, I mean, I think that if, when you talk about prevention, it's not just about the police doing their work, it's actually legitimating the norms that go behind these laws. Yeah. And, and yeah, I just, that's more of a comment, I think. <laughs> Great. That's an excellent comment to end on, unless you've had a, a, a follow-up. No, that's a little follow-up. Okay, okay, well if we can take money for... Uh...